you know, I used to have this cat called Zoe and uh, she was like this beautiful little fluffy white thing. She was like, looked very princess-like. Anyway, she was like the filthiest cat ever. She would go outside all day. She lived till about 18, even up to her last dying day, she'd go out, come back covered in grease, playing in sewers or something like that, looking like the most raggedy thing ever. You know, as she got a bit older, we'd sort of go up to her and cautiously be like, Zoe, are you all right? And she'd be like, Rah! The West Coast Eagles right now remind me of that cat. People would be like, oh, you know, you just lost a card by 71 points. That's not 170. That's pretty good, buddy. And I just want to go, Row! So here in England, uh, I had to get up at 5 a.m. to watch this game, and I had no real expectations, to be honest. Like, Carlton are a red-hot team right now, and uh, we are poor away from home, let alone poor in general. Like, our last handful of games away from Perth, like, what have they been? Brisbane, 81 points. Sydney, 171. Adelaide, 122. I think before that was 116 against Hawthorne. On top of that, Carlton is shit hot right now. Charlie Kerno kicked a bag of nine on us last time. And what happens when I wake up, I sit down, and the first thing I see on my screen is Tom Barras sitting in the coach's box. He's a laid out for Rhett Bazo, and I just, I already thought this was 70 points. I think I tipped in my Just the Tips video, and I thought, that's conservative. We're going to lose by 120. And the way the game progressed, even 120 looked like it was a conservative tip with Carlton just racing the ball out of the center. It was just a procession of Carlton center clearances. The ball was not even being contested in the middle of the ground. It was just being run out of the center. The ball was being launched inside 50. And to be honest, we put... A kid called Rhett Bazo, who's far too young and not ready to be able to be the one key defender in the back line, which he hasn't been at times this year. He is not ready to take on Charlie Kerno, and we put Brady Hoff on him instead. Brady Hoff gives up a good five centimeters and about 13 kilos on Charlie Kerno. So it was a choice between the skinny halfback flanker and Brady Hoff and the undersized key defender who, uh, you know, still needs time at this level. But the way the ball was coming out of the center for Carlton, it really didn't matter who was on him because the ball was being delivered to him on a silver platter, and Charlie Kerno and Carlton basically end the game within 10 minutes. There is plenty of positives from this game, to be honest, because the second half got a lot better, but we need to focus on the abhorrent first quarter. Abhorrent. We know Carlton are a good stoppage team. We know that we're not, but we could have at least put up a fight. Carlton kick nine goals, five to... One goal, two, I think, at quarter time. I think the margin was about 50 points. Forgive me, I've just checked. It was zero goals, two at quarter time. So it was 57 points at quarter time. And 200, again, was looking really in danger. It didn't get much better in the second term. Obviously, we kicked a couple of goals. And we restricted them to just six, which is fantastic. 98 to 16 at halftime. And yeah, I really would have put money on uh, Carlton breaking the 200 mark again. Like I said, things got better in the second half. But we can talk a little bit specifically about clearances. So we were coming up against one of the better clearances sides in the league, but we're also missing Cripps and Chera. The final clearance count was 57 to 25, and I think a lot of this blame goes on some senior midfielders in that team, in particular Sheed and Kelly. So I've got some stats for you. Sheed and Kelly combined for one center clearance in this game. Between them, they had 39 center bounce attendances. So that's when the ball is bounced in the center of the ground. They're one of the three players standing at the foot of the Ruckman. One center clearance from 39 CBAs. By comparison, Chesser and Hewitt had one each from just 18 centre bounce attendances. So those are damning statistics on established midfielders that really, really should be more competitive than they were. The other stat I got for you is that Gaff only attended the centre bounce five times in this game and he won two centre clearances, which is more than Sheed and Kelly combined. So like, forget the fact that we didn't have a, a proper tall opponent for Charlie Kerno in the first quarter and a half. It would not have mattered. There was no way Tom Barras would have been able to get in between Kerno and the ball when it was coming in that hot. And I think Kelly got better in the second half and I don't know if Sheed did. To be honest, he got a few junk time possessions at the end, but I'm starting to think the game has gone past Dom Sheed. He's kind of like this specialist first handball receive midfielder playing in a team that is missing some players who can get their first hands on the footy, in particular, you know, Yo and Shui. Shui obviously got injured in this game, but it doesn't matter. You got to win the ball more than you are Dom Sheed. And when you don't offer that much on the outside, you're kind of just a, a handball receive in space and kick kind of player now. And I think you are capable of so much more than that. So that's the biggest negative to focus on in this game was the, the midfield's performance in terms of uh, both center clearances and just clearances around the ground. The stoppage game was appalling. Carlton are very, very good at it, and we know we're not. But that was largely the reason we were 59-2 to at quarter time. It was 
terrible. So I've had my roast. Uh, obviously, that's where a lot of the game was lost in this game. Um, we didn't have any touch. I think what I really sense now when people teams play the Eagles, particularly a red hot Carlton, is you know when traditionally when a top team plays a bottom team, they might sort of put the foot on the gas at stages throughout the game to coast to a large victory, and they're kind of just saving themselves. But what's happening, you know, when we played Carlton, Sydney and Adelaide is that we are so bad and so non-competitive that they actually start getting really, really aggressive because they can sense the kill really early. There is a serious percentage boost on offer when you play the West Coast Eagles right now. And Carlton had that sense in the first quarter and they played out of their skins. We didn't make it hard for them, but teams are really fucking trying against us. And by comparison, you know, for the first quarter and a half there was no resistance it was pathetic what is it with this trend of starting games so poorly away from home starting games poorly in general actually we started poorly against collingwood at home too and i'm sure i could find with about two minutes research i could find more examples of that but we just can't get our heads in the game early and by the time we've started to settle the game's over and that was exactly what happened in this game a few other negatives obviously shuey doing his hamstring i don't really have too much to report on that other than the fact that yeah, it could be his last game. Who knows? There's only how many games left in the season? Six? Five even? Um, you know, if it's a month-long injury, we might have seen the last of Luke Shuey. But I don't want to think about that till it's happened. We're going to have another force change with Sam petrevsky Seaton um, almost certainly being suspended. It was a bit unlucky. Like, but like a lot of these dangerous tackles, um, they don't require too much malicious intent for them to be suspended. And, you know, he is going to get suspended, and that's fair. It's a pretty much stock standard suspension, but a little bit unlucky, as, as so often these things are. Uh, Kerno kicking 10 was also a negative. That being said, uh, I'm not sure I really buy into this hype around how good that performance was from Charlie Kerno. That will be one of the easiest days of his career. Gun player, probably the best key forward in the competition right now, and I hope he wins the common. Actually, I actually don't really care, but you could see the difference, you know, in particular for someone like Rhett Bazo when Allen went back to Kerno, and Kerno still got plenty of looks at it. A, he's super talented, and Carlton gave him plenty of opportunities, but, you know, Tex Walker kicking 10, Kerno kicking 10 on us right now. West Coast are so bad that it almost shouldn't count towards the record books. So we can talk about uh, what went well in this game for West Coast. Uh, we won the second half by 11 points, and that is a good thing, to be honest. So we do acknowledge that Carlton started to get some mad injuries in that second half and playing largely without a bench. But regardless, you know, percentage was on the line for them, and it is still really critical for their season to, you know, uh, try and put up as a bigger win as possible. And I think we kind of, well, certainly foiled that plan to some extent, um, winning the second half. So it was a, a eight goals to six, admittedly due to some injuries, but we worked our way into the game a lot well. We actually finished the game with more possessions than Carlton which isn't normally something you'd really write home about but because of how bad we were in that first quarter it does show that we started to get our hands on the footy we started to control the ball on the outside we had more uncontested possessions when the ball was there to be won in the tight stuff we weren't really re that competitive but on the outside we started to control the ball well I thought there were certain players you know Gaff played a really good outside game today he had 29 touches he also went at 90% um, efficiency and got six inside 50 so he's continued a second week in a row of some good form. Witherden as well actually played a pretty solid game for West Coast, I think, having 30 disposals at 80% efficiency. So when he's hitting his targets, he's kind of playing his role. He's still not a great defender, still not completely sold on him uh, having a future at West Coast, but he was an important player today in you know a lot of our forward thrusts as many as there were. Brady Hoff has really uh, ascended his game to being a clear best 22 player now. Before he was sort of getting games because of talent, and now I think he's actually, we would really feel it if he went out of the team. Obviously, he had that really good performance against Charlie Cameron a couple of weeks ago, and in this game, he had 21 touches at 90%, and I think he just looks more composed and reliable. And uh, for a guy with his attributes, I think we're going to see him develop into a very, very good footballer. Bailey Williams, I'm going to talk about him all year because he has been fantastic, and it is a serious chance to win our best and fairest this year. In this game, he had 17 disposals at 82% efficiency. Pretty good going for a big man. He also won six clearances. I think the next highest was three I think to Gaff so Williams winning the most clearances really putting Kelly and she to shame in that respect and he also kicked a goal so really playing that forward ruck role to a T at the moment he's the number one ruck eventually you know uh, we'll have a first choice ruck for him to support he can float forward and kick a goal that's exactly what it did today so I'm continuing to love Bailey Williams and what he's producing this year we've seen some uh, continued development from some youngsters so Elijah Hewitt I talked about after the St Kilda game I think this is the player. This is the kid we've got that we will build our team around. And I'm kind of using 
poetic language a little bit because I don't think you actually build any AFL team around one player. But I think this kid has what it takes to be our next top line midfielder. We saw him be dangerous around goals against St Kilda. He had a chance in this game as well to hit the scoreboard. He flies high for marks. He, he's a little bit of a tease with his marking at the moment because he's flown high for quite a number and hasn't pulled one down yet. But he is a marker that you can send out waiting to happen. He had 17 possessions. I thought he was pretty solid. Um, sort of drifted in and out of the game as you'd expect for an 18 year old. Chesser also probably played his best game for his career. 19 touches and also just uh, another player that I note is taking a little bit of time with the footy now and I mean that in a good way in the sense that previously he was just firing off at first option and turning it over and he's still going to make mistakes but there was a passage throughout this game where he sort of stopped in traffic weaved through a few players and hit a good target by foot and I think we are starting to see the benefit of giving him perhaps some undeserved games at the moment but exposure at this level has played played 10 games now I think I've still got faith that there's a player in Campbell Tresser Noah Long continues to sort of stay involved um, whatever he does with the footy is good he only had 10 possessions but he doesn't really mess up and he generally gets the ball in a better position than when it was when he got it which you know it sounds redundant but there's so many players particularly at West Coast who don't do that and Ryan Marrick again continues to prove that he's a clear AFL quality player I think he had one goal and 12 possessions here just looks very capable at the level already and looks super composed. I actually think he is probably our best field kick on our list at the moment. Shuey's probably a little bit more devastating with his 30 to 40 meter passes. He can hit really difficult kicks, but Marrick can probably get him for range a little bit. I saw uh, several 50 meter passes that were just absolutely weighted to perfection. So Ryan Marrick is a player that um, I really hope isn't looking around at West Coast going, oh shit, I wonder how many more 70 to 170 point losses I'm going to really put up with here. And that was something that occurred to me throughout the game. Even though the Harley Reid thing wasn't true, or at least it's reported that it's now not true, I couldn't help but think, I don't blame you for not wanting to come here right now. One of the other plus points was uh, the marks inside 50. So we conceded 63 to 44 inside 50s. I think 44 is a little bit above average for us, but it's still not great compared to the rest of the league. Uh, but in terms of marks inside 50, they only had three more than us. 13 to 10 and when you consider the absentees in uh, Tom Barras and Jeremy McGovern and then Harry Edwards so our first three key defenders gone and considering how easily the ball came out of the center in the first quarter that stat itself um, shows that we really rectified things a bit of a miscellaneous point on Rhett Bazo who um, I think is a talented player who has been given too much exposure this year and has had to do some really unfortunate roles. This is the second game where he's played as the only key back in the side. I'm trying to remember when the other one was. It must have been against Adelaide where Tex kicked 10. He's just not ready to shoulder that burden at the moment. And that's why Hoff went to Kerno, which was again, a complete mismatch. But what I saw with Bazo for the first three quarters was a player really low on confidence and he's making silly mistakes. And to me, naturally, that doesn't indicate a lack of talent. The kid's talented as we saw in the last quarter, which I'll get to, but he was making silly mistakes. And I think that's just low confidence creeping into his game. And he's one player who is in the side at the moment that I don't think is getting much out of being there. In an ideal world, we got Gov and Barras back into the side, get Bazo back into the waffle, build some confidence, develop his one-on-one -on -one game. But having said that, to his credit, he really started to lift, uh, particularly when Allen was on Kerno in that second half. And in the last quarter, he took two really good grabs. So hopefully that is the fire starter that gives him a bit of confidence now and he can continue to perform at AFL level. We'll see. I'd rather have Barras and McGovern in there right now because the avalanche of inside 50s and the clearance battle is so poor that I'd rather have two of our best defenders in there. So we move on to North Melbourne this Sunday. Um, I'm going to Scotland this week, but I'll be back by Sunday. Um, we've got to get up at 7am to watch it. We'll see. It's, they're calling it the Harley Reid Cup, but to be honest, I think we, even if we win this, we'll still be way behind North Melbourne on percentage. So we'd need to win two more games to um, not have pick one. But still, it'll be interesting because it's two of the worst performed sides in the competition right now. I would argue we're performing a lot worse than North Melbourne, but it was a home crowd, a bit of belief. So suddenly, if the players believe they can win, we might see a different performance. And that's what happened against St Kilda. And in theory, North Melbourne aren't as good as St Kilda. But if the two sides play to their talent, then North win. So we'll see. I'll uh, consider who I think will win that game later in the week when I do just the tips. But anyway, guys, let me know your thoughts and comments on this particular game. Uh, it was a weird one. I walk away from it not that filthy because I was filthy at halftime. I actually, I don't even know. I think just defeated at halftime was the, is the way I describe it. Um, it wasn't super angry. I was probably angry at quarter time when it was 59 to two, but anyway, um, some positives there. I, I feel a little bit better about the rebuild now that we've seen some youth playing well. Um, but yeah, the midfield situation is dire. Hopefully we get Yo back. We'll see. But at the moment, we, we just need to really fix whatever the hell we're doing wrong in that midfield. Is it attitude? Is it the players? Is it setups? 
I think it's all three. But anyway, let me know your comments in the comment section below. And as always, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thanks guys, and I'll see you in the next one.